Tatra Masi. You're it. Ha! <laughs> You're everything that's going on. In other words, you are a particular place at which the whole universe is focused. Now you see, when we think, as I pointed out, we equate some kind of symbol with what we call or, or a, a, a separate event in the world. The symbols are separate from each other, but the things are not. This world is a great wiggly affair. Clouds are wiggly. Waters are wiggly. Plants are wiggly. Mountains are wiggly. People are wiggly. But people are always trying to straighten things out. Look, you see, we live in a rectangular boxes, all kinds. Look at the bookshelf, see? Everything's straightened out. So wherever you look around nature and you find things all being straightened out, you know people have been around. <laughs> They're always trying to put things in boxes. Because boxes are classifiers, pigeonholes. Words are labels on boxes. But the real world is wiggly, wiggly, wiggly. Now, when you have a wiggly system like a cloud, how much wiggle is a wiggle? <laughs> well, you have to draw the line somewhere. And so people come to sorts of agreements about uh, how much of a wiggle is a wiggle, that is to say, a thing. One wiggle. And always reduce any one wiggle into sub-wiggles. Or see it as a subordinate wiggle and a bigger wiggle. <laughs> but there's no real fixed rule about it. Where does your head end and your neck begin? Oh, vaguely around here somewhere, but there's nothing really precise. Your head is very different from your feet. They don't look the same at all. But you don't find, in the normal course of events, heads running around without feet, or certainly feet running around without heads. They go together. And as your head and your feet go together, so do you as an organism and your physical environment. Bees and flowers, for example, look very different. But they are one organism. Because there's no bees without flowers, no flowers without bees. The flower. Uh, opens itself and uh, distributes perfume into the air. The bee, uh, but it's rooted to the ground. The bee is independent and buzzes. But the thing is really a flower bee. That's what's going on. Just in the same way as inside you, your organs look very different from each other. The brain is very different from the stomach. But they're inseparable. So then, what happens in the confusion of symbol with reality is that eventually you confuse your idea of yourself with yourself. Your ego, what you mean by I in the ordinary way, is your conception of yourself. It is, as it were, the symbol for your actual living organism and the one is not the other, and they belong to quite different orders of reality. The organism, as what I will for the moment call a physical reality, is of course a process. It is an energy system. It can do something. But the ego is a symbol and is not an energy system, and cannot do anything. Just as you cannot tie up a parcel with the equator. The equator is an imaginary line, very useful for purposes of navigation, but not, must not be confused with a physical reality. So in just the same way, the ego, the concept of I, which is given a name, John Doe, Alan Watts, Mary Smith, or whatever it happens to be, is, is a concept. 
It's a method of tagging people. But it isn't real. Just as you cannot strangle someone with your telephone number. <laughs> but it doesn't deny the usefulness of a telephone number. Now, how do you get this? How does it arise in anybody's individual life? I've traced the, uh, the, the arising of it from the point of view of civilization as a whole, pointing out that when man developed symbolic systems, uh, and they worked so well for him that he began to confuse the symbols with the reality. But now what about in, in, in one's personal life? Well, you see, when you're a little child, all your society around you, your parents, your teachers, your peers, are telling you who you are. It's very important to tag people. We get disconcerted by a person who doesn't have a tag. If I can't make out whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, why well, you must be a communist. <laughs> I feel safe with you if I know you're a Republican or a Democrat then I know what, you, what you're going to think about almost anything. You know, uh, you can always tell somebody says, well, I'm a bircher or I'm a uh, communist or whatever he says. You can predict what he will think about almost any subject. That means he's stupid. Because anybody whose thinking is completely predictable is unintelligent. Because unadaptable to surprising situations. He won't know what to do about that. doesn't say in the book what I'm supposed to think about that. The party line doesn't tell me. But we like to have people safely labeled in that way. And so it isn't only matters of political difference, but also religious and also character types. We've read novels for so long that we believe characters should be consistent. There always are in novels, except in the new anti-novels. <laughs> so that people aren't consistent at all. <laughs> but they're supposed to be. And they're made to feel guilty if they're not. So what you learn to do in your education is to act a social role that is acceptable. You have several to choose from. I mean, with, with men, you can be the strong, silent type. You can be the intellectual, studious type. You can be the clown type. You can be a standard drunk. Uh, there are all sorts of more or less predictable roles that you can act in life and that you will get away with. So when, as a child, you one day met a child that you admired very much and you came home imitating that child's mannerisms, you bugged your mother because she didn't know who you were. So, Johnny, that's not you, that's Peter. <laughs> and made you feel guilty about that. But then you see what they do to you. The, the, I've just explained the system of social brainwashing. They say, now you, Johnny, are a person, a real person. At least you've got to try to be. And that means that you're a free agent. You're responsible. And you can be praised for the good things you do and blamed for the bad things you do. Because you're independent, you're free, you're separate. <laughs> now, the difficulty for a child is, little child especially, is it has no way of criticizing this information. Social pressure is irresistible. Everybody tells Johnny he's a free agent. So he believes he is. Why? Because he can't help it. See the paradox? He is compelled to be free. <laughs> then he's further told. Now, we, we, want, we want free conduct out of you. Uh, we want you to love us. Not, of course, because we say so, but because you really want to. <laughs> in other words, you are required to behave in such a way that will be acceptable only if you do it voluntarily. <laughs> now, no wonder everybody feels mixed up. Because we spend the rest of our lives trying to resolve that paradox. Well, there's the root of the matter, you see. 
that uh, we have this confusion between our symbolic personality on the one hand and our living organism on the other. And it's the living organism that's real. We need to take a closer look at that too. What sort of reality is that? Well, it's not what we think it is. It isn't a sort of a thing, it's a process. It would be better described by a verb than a noun. A body is a bodying. <coughs> it's like a whirlpool in a stream. You can go every day and see the whirlpool is there in the same place but no water stays in it because uh, the whirlpool is a behavior it's a dance and you recognize it from day to day because it's the same dance from day to day the same pattern and you recognize a person from day to day because it's doing the same sort of dance or is the same sort of dance you don't have to have an it that does the dance any more than uh, when you say it is raining, there is some mysterious it that is doing the raining. <laughs> the raining is, the, is raining, you see. So everybody is a dancing pattern in a stream. A stream of vegetables, beefsteak, milk, water, air, cosmic rays, heaven only knows what. But you're a certain kind of a jazz. And if you were aware of that, if you came to realize that your organism is you, you would make another startling discovery that your organism knows all the time, which is that it's one process with the rest of the world. Just as the sea waves, you can't isolate a wave, can you? There is waving. And as there is the sea is waving and the world is peopling, uh, you are a wave of the world energy saying, you -hoo, I'm here, see? Take notice, what a funny thing I'm doing today, says the universe, with each one of you. <laughs> and so, if, in other words, the organism, in its bones, shall we say, knows all that, but you don't know it with your conscious attention, because you can't get to look at yourself and you're confused with your ego, which is to say, your social role, your person. The word person means mask. Persona in Latin, that through which the sound comes. The megaphone mask worn by actors in Greco-Roman drama. So the word person uh, coming to mean when we say someone is a real person. That means it's a genuine fake. <laughs> no, like some antiques. <laughs> <laughs> So, it is then as a result of this way, of this fragmented, broken up, bitty way of thinking about the world, that we feel disconnected, cut off, isolated, and therefore, we, since we cannot see the self directly, or experience it directly, as an object out there. We put all sorts of superstitions onto it. It's like people thinking about death. You can't imagine death. And so they, onto this void, one projects all sorts of things. People are afraid of death. Uh, they think, um, oh, what's it going to be like to go to sleep and never wake up? And they imagine themselves being shut up in the dark forever <laughs> and get, get bugged by it. But on the other hand, when you start thinking about what will it be like to go to sleep and never wake up, it suddenly occurs to you that when you were born, you woke up without ever having gone to sleep. It's rather funny. And of course, if it happened once, it can happen again. And that begins to get you real puzzled about what you mean by you. But everybody feels he's I. Everybody has this sensation of being in the middle of everything. 
turn around and see more or less equally in all directions, and you feel that you're in the center. Everybody feels in the center, just as much as I do. In fact, insects feel they're in the center, and I'm quite sure they feel that they're people. We don't, of course, don't bother to notice them in any great detail, and therefore they all look the same, and therefore we say, well, they're not people. They're all alike. They're some sort of mechanisms. Well, they look at us in just the same way, and they can't make any sense out of what we're doing. So we're some sort of funny mechanisms going around, so far as they're concerned. But so there's a lot of mystery hidden in this self that we have. Well, of course, you see, we're worried about it. We see the organism vanishes. We're always defending our personalities. And somebody accuses our personality of falling apart and say, now, you're not being consistent. You're not fulfilling what you said you would do. You're not playing the role you're supposed to play. Everybody feels that they're coming apart because they're not acting right, as on the stage. So we are constantly on the defensive. And also, we're a prey to anxiety. Anxiety is a trembling motion. To be or not to be, that is the question. Because the minute you know you're alive, and really become aware of being alive, you realize that you might also be dead. Because to be implies not to be. And not to be, although we don't really think about that, implies to be. So we're always wondering, now if I do this, will I survive? Or would I better do that? And we're never quite sure. Because you think when you get a really important decision, and you've got to make it, you wonder, did I take everything into consideration? Did I make a sensible judgment? Well, you never know. Because in the best thought out plan, uh, always chancy things occur. You don't know whether you're going to slip on a banana skin, or whether you're going to get sick. It's all very unpredictable. And therefore, we, do, we tremble. Shall I do this? Shall I do that? See? Now, when it occurs to us, of course, it doesn't in the ordinary way, that there is no choice between to be and not to be. Just as there's no choice between front and back. Space implies solid just as much as solid implies space. But conscious attention ignores that. It suffers from ignorance. We notice the figure and ignore the background. We notice the solid and ignore the space. We notice the relatively moving in smaller object, but we ignore the relatively stationary background. That's with consciousness, with noticing. And so, you see, we don't notice that in order to be present, you must also be absent. Because life is an energy system. And energy is something that vibrates. And whatever vibrates goes on and off. If I sit next to a girl in the movies, and she attracts me, and I put my hand on her knee, and just leave it there, she will in due course cease to notice it. Because it's a constant stimulus. But if I gently stroke her or pat her on the knee, she will keep noticing it, because it goes on and off. Now, all energy systems go on and off. You can't know you're on unless you're off, too. <laughs> so we get waking and sleeping. We get every kind of rhythm. And there are tiny rhythms that go dig, 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 so fast, like a, a beam of light, that you don't notice the spaces, because your retina doesn't react uh, quickly enough. It reacts to the stimulus of the on, uh, but it, before it can go off, there's a new on. See? So you get what appears to be a constant stimulus. The table appears to be hard. It's vibrating so fast, I can't put my finger through it. Same way as an airplane propeller appears to be a solid or an electric fan. But it's all going on and off. Now, there are these very fast vibrations of on and off, and there are very slow ones, like life and death. 
Now you see it, now you don't. And that's what the world is. But because of the focusing of conscious attention, which regards on as real and off as unreal, because it, you ignore it, regards solid as real and space as unreal, it's like trying to have, <coughs> trying to think of, of waves as a series of crests without any troughs. But a wave is a, is a crest trough. On off. So off is as important as on. You can't have anything happening without both. And although they are explicitly different, on and off, they're implicitly one. And we call it energy. <coughs> So if these neglected and ignored features of the world came to our attention or in some way could impinge upon our consciousness, we should feel very differently than we ordinarily do feel. How would you feel? Well, I can roughly describe it to you. <coughs> it's a very odd feeling indeed at first. You feel that what you are doing and what happens to you are the same. You can say of everything that happens to you, I'm doing it. And of everything that you are doing is that it happens to me. <laughs> For example, when you're steering a car, are you pulling the wheel or pushing it? It's push-pull, isn't it? Both. Although the words push and pull are formally, logically opposed to each other. But that's what you're doing when you're steering, you're push-pulling. So in exactly the same way, when you are uh, acting, what your environment does and what you do are the same process. So when you feel that, it's very odd. You feel that as you walk up a hill, the hill is lifting you. <laughs> that uh, a lot of people go crazy with this because they suddenly say, well, I'm God. I'm doing everything. And if then they start to tell everybody that they're God and people object and say, well, you, it's absolutely preposterous that you should say you're personally in charge of the whole universe and therefore should be bowed down to and given divine honors, you must be mad. Or a person may take entirely the opposite point of view and say, I do nothing. I'm just a little puppet on the end of strings, and everything I do is controlled by something else. In other words, becomes a complete fatalist. What he doesn't see is that both points of view are right. But of course... It, this won't fit in with an idea of God which is based on the ancient monarchies of the Near East. That is to say, it won't do with an idea of God conceived as the cosmic boss. The boss, the chief, that's a political image. And it just doesn't work too well for the Godhead. It leads to all sorts of trouble. And as I often say for Americans, you'd believe, don't you, as American citizens, that a republic is the best form of government? How can you square that with thinking of heaven as a monarchy? If heaven is a monarchy, monarchy is the best form of government. What about democracy in the kingdom of heaven? How about that now? <laughs> So, uh, you, have to, you have to conceive God in accordance with some different kind of image. Or maybe, wait a moment, maybe we shouldn't do that at all. Images of God are idolatry, aren't they? There are no image. Because every Im image uh, is an idol, and idols that are made of imagination and thought are much more dangerous than idols made of wood or stone. Nobody takes a wooden idol seriously. You merely regard it as a symbol, and it's such an obvious symbol. But a concept that seems so spiritual, so abstract. But it's the most dangerous kind of idol, as we shall see when we come to the study of Buddhism.
how it gets rid of all the conceptual idols. So then, if we woke up and became disillusioned, disenchanted, or unspellbound, you know, you spell words, and it's words that spellbind us. You hypnotize people by talking to them. So if we get free from the beguilement of words, we should wake up and find ourselves in this very different situation where you would know that you and the universe are really the same process. You, as an organism, are a, an operation of the universe. The real you, though, is, is the whole thing. That's why in that rather fumbling proto-science called astrology. When you wanted to draw a picture of a person's soul, you drew a crude picture of the universe, his horoscope. Because your soul isn't in your body, your body's in your soul. And your soul is the entire arrangement of forces constituting this universe. centered on your physical organism. So that's why the astrologer took the time and place of a person's birth and said, how are the heavens arranged around that? That's why you are, the soul is in heaven. The, the, the meaning of that, it is heaven. <laughs> it's the total arrangement of cosmic forces, the total pattern. And when you wake up to that, and actually feel it to be so, I assure you, it's just great. And you stop worrying about any, I mean, you, you, you may, you, you still are sensible enough not to walk into a fire, but you, you get rid of that deep central anxiety. Because it's like the universe has nothing to fall onto if it drops. And a fall uh, will only be disastrous if there's a floor of concrete down below. The universe has nothing to fall onto. Everything in it is dropping. The earth is dropping around the sun. And just so long as there isn't a planet in the way or something like that, nothing happens. And the system as a whole. There isn't anything else. So why worry? Besides, if you disappear, as an organism, great. Because if you went on too long, you get tired of yourself. And so what was a new surprise in store? The thing is a self-surprising system. That's why it goes on. When you know the future perfectly, it's already past. You've had it. When you know the outcome of a game, and it becomes certain, you cancel it and begin another one. So to know too much, gets you nowhere. <laughs> and you say, who's in charge around here? Well, nobody's in charge. There never was anybody in charge.